It is a great pleasure and joy to be here with you guys. Um, I have gotten the awesome privilege to get to know some of you guys and to get to know your pastor. I know not everyone that's in attendance or will be watching later knows uh, Pastor Andy and Emma personally, but um, I just want to say what a blessing they are uh, to me personally, uh, the ministry at Love Life, to you guys uh, in this church, and really to the city. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak at a conference, which I believe is of utmost importance. We don't have the privilege uh, that we had maybe a couple years ago. Um, not that we really ever truly had the privilege, but we live in a time that's so volatile, a time that is so polemic, a time that is, as Brother Michael said last night, fastly changing. And so the call to be faithful in the midst of opposition is, is not even a choice anymore. If you are a Christian and you are faithful, you will face opposition. Uh, I feel a little bit inadequate uh, to deliver this message. I'll never forget a couple years ago, I was asked to preach in Uttar Pradesh in India, and it was a pastor's conference, leader, pastor and leaders conference, and the theme was persecution. And, you know, they're facing like legit persecution. And I told the pastor who was organizing the conference, I said, brother, I, I feel extremely inadequate uh, to come and lead your people and, and speak about persecution because I'm an American who's never really faced persecution. He said, brother, he said, we don't want to know what you have to say about persecution. We want to know what God has to say through the Bible. And so um, even in, as Andy introed me, um, at our ministry at Love Life here, we we interpose, we stand and offer mercy for children who are uh, going to uh, have their limbs ripped apart and who will be uh, chemically uh, euthanized and destroyed. And many of the faithful sidewalk counselors here in New York City have been physically assaulted, verbally assaulted. They've been spit on. Uh, they've been mocked and reviled. And I am sort of like, you know, the coach. And so I coach them through that. Um, I, I do spend some time on the front lines in Charlotte, but um, I, I do feel in the same way I did in India, a little inadequate to preach about faithfulness and opposition because I've, I've seen people here do it at a tremendously high everyday level. And so I'm going to try to do my best just to tell you what God says and, and hope that he will inspire you and call you to uh, greater faithfulness. So I want to start with uh, showing a picture of my family. Got a beautiful family. So um, back in the day, they used to have these things called wallets. And in them, they put pictures, like these physical pieces of paper. Where And, and so what proud dads did is that they'd go somewhere, and if you're sitting next to someone in a restaurant or on the bus or the plane, you say, hey, here's a picture of my family. So I'm doing that digitally. Uh, here's my family. Um, I've been married to my wife for 12 years. We have five sons. Uh, the one on the left joined the Navy 10 days ago. The one in the middle graduated this year. He joined a few days ago. Um, so I, I tell everyone all the time, the one on the left, his name's Jake. He's my athlete. The one in the middle, that's Logan. He's my artist. He's a musician and he, he's just very creative. Uh, the one on the far right's Josh. He's my runner. This guy literally just told me he, he ran a, you know, sub 18 uh, cross country, if you know what that means, to this morning. Um, and then the one in the middle, he's Lucas. He's my artist. He's, he's, he's good with the pen. And then uh, on the bottom right is Moses, and he's my favorite. <laughs> and uh, I'm very proud of them, but I'm most proud to be uh, the husband of my wife, Carolina, from South America, Colombia. And I'll show you that picture because it's, it's really an example and a testament of how God can use anyone um, who will say yes to the Lord and be, obe be obedient. Uh, God will bless you in tremendous ways, and it, it might not always equate to uh, the riches of this world, but it will, it will equate to the riches of, of family and blessing and leadership and influence. And I am very biased, but I will put my five sons up against your five sons any day of the week. I love them. I'm proud of them. I'm grateful for them. So that's me showing you a picture of my family. But I want to tell you that I wasn't always a passionate, zealous Christian. I alluded to it yesterday. I used to be a very passionate, zealous sinner. Um, I was the kind of person who would introduce uh, church people to things like marijuana and cocaine and, 
and and I would I would try to show them what I thought was the better way, uh, the path to enlightenment, the path to self self fulfillment, which was uh, induced through chemicals and <clears throat> entertainment, travel. I traveled the world. Anything that I could do to kind of please my flesh, I pursued with a uh, unholy uh, zeal. And then the Lord, by His grace, in 2010 as I was steeped in my sin and, and my life was spiraling out of control, uh, a friend of mine was a mortgage broker. And um, I was in a relationship with my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. We've gone to 1 Samuel 13, but I, 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 was, I was living with my girlfriend and our relationship was spiraling out of control. And I thought, man, you know what would fix this relationship? If we get a home together, right? That, that's the way I was thinking. If we have some sort of permanent commitment, and I went to my friend who was a mortgage broker and he shared with me that um, my credit was sub 500. I was living paycheck to paycheck and I didn't get the home loan, but I got the gospel. And he shared with me that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, the life, that I was a sinner. I was headed for hell and I was in desperate need of Jesus as my Lord and my savior. And by God's grace, three months later, um, after a uh, just a disastrous night of drinking and, and wiling out. I woke up laying in bed with my wife sitting next to me and I heard her sniffling. And <clears throat> my wife said, and this is what I remember, her saying to me, this isn't who God created you to be. And I got saved right there on the third floor of my townhouse. There wasn't an altar. There wasn't a sermon. There wasn't, it was literally the spirit of God in that moment took me someone who was passionate about my own sin and turned my heart and, and turned my affections to the Lord. And so from there, I got plugged into a good church like this. I got plugged in uh, with discipleship groups of men who are willing to pour into me and teach me to obey the scriptures. A month after being saved, I was baptized. A few weeks after that, I was married. Uh, a few months after that, miraculously, my credit was good enough to get a house. We started building our family. And then I started looking at the church and I had developed a deep passion for life-on-life uh, -life discipleship. You know, much what you guys do here in this city. Um, what I love about New York City versus the South is uh, most people in the South historically um, would consider themselves good people who, you know, historically might identify with some form of Christianity. Um, it doesn't cost much to be a Christian in Charlotte. And I will say the landscape has changed drastically in the past five to 10 years. But historically, being a Christian was kind of cultural. And what I love about this church, what I love about being a Christian in New York City is it's, it costs you something. Um, to identify as a Christian is not a cool thing in the city. Maybe it's cool in this church, but uh, the 99.9% .9 of the people in the city do not like you guys. And so I like you guys. I am, I, I like that. I want to be known. I don't want to be known as anything cultural. Christ is greater than the culture. And so we um, we're called to uh, to be Christians, to be salt and light. And so I love that about this. So I wanted to be that in Charlotte. So we created a church uh, by God's grace that was passionate about uh, evangelism and discipleship and studying the Bible and inviting people into our homes and doing all the stuff we saw in Scripture uh, in the book of Acts. We, we were zealous to do that. Um, we were a small church plant that started with two families. I had a pretty uh, lucrative sales career. Uh, I took a six-figure pay cut to, to go and pastor this church. When we started our church, I, there was $5 in the, in the bank account. Or we didn't have a bank account. We had a coffee can with a little hole at the top, and someone put $5 in there. When I felt the Lord called me into this, the other pastor said, Brother, you know, you know we got $5 in the account, and you got five kids. I was like, man, I, I feel like the Lord's in this, like we're going to move forward. And by God's grace, he's always provided. So I was zealous. We're preaching, we're teaching. People in the city are, are being attracted to what we're doing. And then we got invited to move into the inner city to revitalize um, a church that was, you know, on, on death's doorstep. And it was this church that was kind of on both sides of the tracks, the haves and have nots, uh, this multi-million dollar piece of property. We're, we're a church with nothing. So I saw these great opportunities and I, and I asked my wife, like, hey, do we want to move? Do you want to uproot our family from the suburbs and move, uh, you know, basically in an urban environment? And uh, she said no. And I kept pursuing and asking, felt like the Lord was in it. We started serving down there in the homeless community. Eventually she's like, man, this is, I think we need to be down here full time. 
And so by God's grace, we moved down. We decided we were going to partner with this church in hopes of revitalizing it. I moved into the parsonage, which is right on the street corner. Um, we lived there and instantaneously. We, we had homeless folks sleeping on our doorstep. It's nothing foreign to you guys here in New York City, but it was a very uh, eye-opening experience. We heard gunshots regularly. Uh, we lived down there when all the Black Lives Matter stuff was going on. And we'd regularly hear fireworks, gunshots, couldn't tell the difference. Just being on edge almost the whole time we were down there. And, um, but we felt called to be there. We started reaching uh, people into uh, the tattoo scene and skaters and, you know, kind of outcasts and love those folks. But we were, we were rejected by the church that we went to help out. Um, and hopefully I'm not rejected by you guys. One of the reasons why is I, I don't like wearing ties. So if you notice, I'm the first speaker in this conference without a tie. I didn't wear a tie the first time I preached here a year ago and Andy asked me back. So I figured it was okay to, to not wear one this, this time, but, but they were, they didn't appreciate um, the ways that we dishonored their traditions. And I wasn't seeking to be rebellious. It's just, I don't like wearing ties. We did the Lord's Supper every week. They didn't like that. Um, you know, we were just different. We got a bunch of kids. Our church grew from two families to 40 families. God was moving. And, um, I would say out of the 120 or so folks, 60% of them were under 18. So some people would say it was like a glorified youth group. <laughs> uh, and I was the oldest guy in the church or one of the, one of the oldest guys in the church. So the Lord was moving. Well, we ended up relocating to another location, which was a, a much bigger room to, to kind of handle our growth. We realized the merger wasn't really working out. And 2020 happened. And all the nonsense happened. Uh, the COVID lockdowns, the, the George Floyd, uh, Black Lives Matter riots, the uh, mask mandates, all this stuff started happening. And I found myself in a position where I was trying to manage people's expectations. And that is a horrible place to be. God has not called us to manage people's expectations. God, God's called us to deliver the mail in a loving and winsome way to be full of truth and full of love and then let him deal with the results. So I'm trying to minister to our now 130, 40 people in our church. And there's people that are, you know, on both sides of the argument. And I'm trying to make sure that everyone's okay in the same room. And eventually I was so worn out and so depressed and depleted that I was sitting in my living room one night and my wife looked at me and she said, are you, are you here? I'm like, yeah, like, of course I'm here. She's like, it's, it's like you're not with us. And I found myself offering to the church filet mignon and offering to my family crumbs on the floor. And every pastor will tell you that um, never put your family above the church. Never, like, over, never overstep your family to get to people in the congregation because your church... The name on your church may change. People in your church and fellowship might change, but you'll always be a father. You'll always be a husband. And those people should come first. And then I found myself in, in that seat of what, what happened? How did we get here? And God threw me a lifeline. Around the same time I was struggling with these decisions, um, the ministry of love life through COVID, ironically, you know, what Satan means for evil, God will use for good. Um, Love Life was interposing in Charlotte at the abortion center. We were standing out there offering the hope of the gospel and the help of the church to moms. Um, in the midst of lockdown, we weren't allowed to be there. And our founder, Justin Reeder, and some others were arrested uh, just simply for being outside. Meanwhile, abortion centers were open. Uh, people, the bars were open. Uh, liquor stores were open. But churches were closed and Christians weren't allowed to stand out and offer hope and help. And so they got arrested and I think it was Ted Cruz retweeted um, what happened and it went viral. And people from all across the nation started reaching out to Love Life saying, we wanna do this in our city. At the same time, I'm feeling discouraged and I'm feeling like, man, the Lord might be calling me into something else. Justin Reeder, who's a friend of mine, is processing this with me. He said, man, I think there's a position at Love Life for you to really do what God's called you to do. I love traveling, I love, I'm the director of expansion. I love doing that kind of work. And so I stepped into this role and what it started to do is it started to revive me. 
If you didn't know, and I hope it's not true in this church, but most pastors are overworked, underpaid, and poorly assisted. Okay? Don't ever let Pastor Andy or any of your future pastors be overworked, underpaid, and poorly assisted. That's a recipe for burnout. And my people didn't know, and I didn't know, but that's kind of what happened to me. Overworked, underpaid, poorly assisted. And I have a great church, if anybody's watching this. They, they assisted me well, but I was doing the admin. I was, I was doing a lot of stuff I shouldn't, I shouldn't have been doing. And I was getting burnt out. And Love Life started to revive me. And then a couple weeks ago, um, I was at this conference called OSA, Operation Save America. These are like the, the, the radical Michael Fallons of the, uh, the abortion. These guys have been fighting this stuff for, for decades, and, and some would call them radical. Um, and I was at this conference, and I met a friend of mine, and he was telling me stories of how he got to where he's at. He's someone I would look up to and aspire to one day be like. And he started telling me stories about how the Lord had really positioned him where he was at. And it was very inspiring. And he, he told me that, hey, Brian, like, it's no secret, but I just would get away with God on a mountain. And I would ask the Lord to confirm or deny what I thought was the desires of my heart. And I would intentionally do hard hikes, um, you know, in the mountains of Virginia. And, and something's, this is like 2 a.m., we were driving home from dinner, and then the hotel parking lot, and I'm just like, this wild hair got on me, and I'm like, man, I would like to do that if you ever do that again. Like, that sounds like something I, I would like to do. Well, the next day he called me, I'm back in Charlotte. He's like, hey, how's the end of September sound? We're gonna, we're gonna do one of these prayer hikes. And I'm like, man, that sounds awesome. He's like, you wanna go to the Grand Tetons? I'm like, man, that sounds awesome. And I look at the airfare and it's, it's a little bit out there. And, uh, and he graciously said, man, I'll, I'll take care of it. You know, I'll, I'll take care of it, I want you to come. And so he books the travel and all of a sudden, I was like, what do I need to do to get ready? He was like, well, we're gonna be doing 15 mile hikes in Grand Tetons with a mild change of elevation. And I'm like, like when's the, raise your hand, when's the last time you walked 15 miles? <laughs> well, you guys live in New York. It's like, that's like every day. <laughs> I live in the suburbs, man. So, so that's not something I had to do, but all of a sudden I couldn't back out. And so I had this external motivation that was creating in me this internal motivation. And I started realizing that as I'm watching this guy who was zealous and who was going for it, it started to remind me of someone I, I once knew. And it was me. Until I started getting bogged down with the everyday things of church, I was a zealous guy who was willing to go for it. And somehow along, along the way, when the church started growing, I started becoming this manager instead of a, a leader. I was just managing people. I tell people all the time, I'm a starter, I'm not a sustainer. My gifting is not to, to make sure everyone's okay. My gift is to go and reach people and bring them in. And so that's what God's been doing in my life. And I shared that as a very long intro, but I shared that along with this passage we're gonna to read today. But I wanna encourage you that you are going to face some tough decisions in your life. You are going to Figure out what, what city you're going to live in, what church you're going to be a part of, what husband, what wife you're going to marry. And I want to encourage you to make those decisions full of faith. I don't want you to become like me and start to make pragmatic decisions that are essentially full of fear. You're just managing your life. God hasn't called us to be managers of our life. God's called us to be bold, zealous people who live sold out for him. The last two years haven't been easy. On any of us, um, this thing's affected everyone. If you have kids, it's a confusing time to raise your kids. If you like hip hop music, which maybe it's just me, like literally yesterday, Eminem came out with a gospel. Eminem's preach, is singing about Jesus. He's rapping about Jesus. Like this is weird times we're in. <laughs> if, if that doesn't tell you that like we're in like the weirdest days, Eminem is literally rapping about Jesus. And it was actually decent, right, Rick? He, he, Rick didn't like it. Um, it it's decent, but it's, we're just in weird times. And so the passage we're going to read today, I think, is going to give us some insight on who God has called us to be and what God has called us to do. 
So it's a very long passage. Um, Pat didn't have, he didn't, he didn't open the Bible much, so I feel like I need to make up for his not opening the Bible. So, uh, and I loved his message, by the way. But as we read this passage, I want you, I want you to think about this question because everyone in here is a leader. Everyone in here is a leader. The question is, what kind of leader do you want to be? A fearful leader or a faithful leader? Do you want to be led by the fear of man or the fear of the Lord? And so as we read this, this long passage, I want you guys to be listening for examples of faithfulness and fearfulness. Now we know faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The definition of full is to contain or hold as much or as many as possible. So when you read and study the Bible, God is going to fill you with faith, which leads to the word faithful with one L. And that means to be loyal, devoted, and true. And so as, as you study the word and as you hear the word preached and taught and in your quiet time, the idea is that God would fill you with a greater faith so that you would go and obey what you've heard. And so we're going to be reading today from the, the book of 1 Samuel. It's a great book. Um, 1 Samuel records the history of Israel in the land of Canaan as they move from the rule of judges to being a unified nation under kings. Samuel emerges as the last judge and he anoints the first two kings, Saul and David. Now, David historically gets the most shine as far as his leadership, but today I want to focus on another faithful leader that doesn't get discussed as much, and that's Jonathan. And my hopes is that as we look at this example from 1 Samuel 13 and 14 of Jonathan's life, you guys will be encouraged to be more faithful as you lead in the midst of opposition. So if you're able, we're going to stand and we're going to read together a lot of passages. I don't know if this might be a record. Andy, maybe you read entire chapters. I typically don't in my church, but I want to read this because I think it's very important. So we're going to read 1 Samuel 13, verse 1, to 1 Samuel 14, um, verse 23, okay? And I want to thank Monica. She, uh, last night, she, or this morning, she literally put all these, I told her I'm not doing any slides, and then it's like, hey, by the way, can you create like 100 slides for me? So thank you, Monica. Okay, verse 1. <clears throat> Got verse 1 up there, okay. I'm reading from the ESV. Monica, you did ESV, right? Okay. Uh, sorry, Michael. Um, verse one, Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash in the hill country of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba. And the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops, like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped at Michmash to the east of beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God in which he commanded you. 
For when the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel rose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people who were present with them stayed in Geba of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned towards Ophrah, to the land of Shul. Another company turned toward Beth Heron, and another company turned toward the border that looks down on the valley of Zeboim, toward the wilderness. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords or spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, or his sickle. And the charge was two thirds of a shekel for the plowshares and for the mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening the axes and for setting the goads. So on the day of the battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan, but Saul and Jonathan, his son, had them. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. Chapter 14. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young men who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Philae, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Sina. The one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash and the other on the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of those uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And the armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, behold, we will cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up for the Lord has given them into our hand. And this shall be the sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, killed about 20 men, as it were, half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison, and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked and it became a very great panic. Verse 16, and the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, count and see who has gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here for the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now, while Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle and behold, Every Philistine sword was against his fellow, and there was great confusion. Now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time and who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim 
heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed beyond beth Aven. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, thank you for this great passage, Father. Thank you for your word that was inspired and preserved for us today to study in 2022. I pray, God, that you would take the word and that you would uh, empower us to do the work of the word. Thank you, God, that we don't battle alone. Thank you, God, that the victory is won and that we get to fight alongside with you and our brothers and sisters. So I pray, God, that you would uh, inspire us to be great leaders, uh, full of faith in the midst of any opposition. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. You already are. All right. So, um, so very, very long passage. Uh, Andy said I only had till 12 to exposit all of it. So um, hopefully uh, John is okay with that. Just kidding. I'm going to give you guys some, some general principles uh, from this passage. Uh, that's why I read it all. There's, there's different parts I want to touch on. Um, but I hope that just at a, at a cursatory reading, you started to see real examples of faithfulness and fearfulness. And I don't know if, uh, if, if you guys do this at your church. I encourage my church uh, to bring their physical Bibles to church and also to bring um, a notebook to take notes. Um, there is studies that say that when you, when you write down with your hand and you see the words that you're thinking appear on paper, that you have like a 20 or 30% chance more of actually remembering and applying that. So it's a good practice for you to do that. And plus, you can't remember everything that uh, anyone preaches. So, so hopefully you'll take away a couple notes. My, my encouragement to you is, as I read through these five points, that one of these will, will speak to you and that God will use it to empower you and that you won't just be hearers of the word, but you'll be doers of the word. Amen. So the title of the sermon is Faithfulness Under Opposition. And the first point is, in the midst of opposition... A faithful leader isn't a fearful leader. So we all want to be faithful leaders, hopefully by God's grace. And we see that in 1 Samuel 13, verses 5 through 14. I won't read them all. But we see that um, Saul was told to, to wait seven days for Samuel's return, and then he was to make a, a sacrifice. These seven days were evidently to teach Saul patience and dependence on God. Um, the first brother that preached on Wednesday night, Thursday night, uh, taught us that waiting on the Lord is, is difficult, but we should never take matters into our own hands. Think about um, the curse of Hagar and Ishmael and the havoc that's wreaked on the globe. And that's what happens when we take matters into our own hands. So we see Saul here waiting seven days but just barely because as soon as the week was up, he offered the sacrifice on his own, refusing to wait any longer for Samuel. In this presumptuous act, Saul showed a variety of weakness that made him unfit to be the king, including patient impatience and self-reliance. His offering showed that he did not want to work together with Samuel. And ultimately he didn't want to work together with God. Saul's sacrifice was therefore sinful, and it was ultimately that which was what cursed him. As the Bible says that God was looking for a man after God's own heart, and Samuel, excuse me, um, Saul sought to do things his own way. Samuel was a prophet and a person of authority, and so when he spoke to Saul, Saul should have listened as though the word of the Lord had been spoken to Saul, and yet he chose to do things his own way. He made a decision out of fear of losing his people. His people were going into hiding. The scripture says they were trembling. The Philistines were, were coming down on them. They, they, they were, there was much opposition. And we see his response was out of fear instead of faith. Now, it's easy to point the finger at Saul and, and, and say, what's wrong with you? But I think in this particular passage, this is where I found myself in 2020. That's why I had that super long intro is because this is where I found myself. The world was, was encroaching in. Listen, I've been studying the bloodlines of the Illuminati since the early 1990s, right? I'm the king of conspiracy truth. 
I'll say conspiracy theories. And so when all this stuff started coming out in 2020, I was the first guy like, something don't smell right. But in an effort to lead my people, I was like, you know, everyone's going to think I'm the guy. If my 2022 self could have talked to me back in 20, I was like, tinfoil hat's on. Like, that doesn't seem like any of this stuff would actually happen. So I'm trying to lead my people in a way that I've been taught. You know, we just preach Christ-centered sermons. We don't talk about the culture. We don't engage the culture. We just preach Christ-centered sermons. That's what I was taught in school. Like we leave everything's, we don't talk about politics. We don't talk about cultural moments. We just preach the Bible. And so we have this massive cultural moment in 2020 and all of a sudden I hadn't been taught or shown. I didn't know about Michael Fallon's podcast back then. I hadn't seen men of God leading in that direction. So I started to lead as, as Saul did. I mean, I don't, I don't want to lose my people. Like after all, these people are the ones that pay me. If these people leave, I'll, I won't get a raise. I'm underpaid. Like I want more people at our church. In essence, I mean, that wasn't my leading motivator, but I'm telling you, that's, that's what motivates pastors, preachers, because they're underpaid, overworked, poorly assisted. So they start leading out of fear. We're, we don't want to lose people. And so I want to, I want to ask the question, where in your life, in the past, or maybe today, are you living in fear? Are you leading in fear? Are you making decisions that's, that's based upon, I don't, I don't want to lose, I'm self-preservation. Where is that thing in your life? If you've got your, your, your pen and paper, write it down. Write it down and ask the Lord to give you faith in the midst of this fearful time. Second point is this, in the midst of opposition, a faithful leader has a plan. We start to see the contrast between Jonathan and his father, Saul. Saul's eyes were on what? The opposition. He was leading in a way where his people were in fear. His fear spread throughout the camp. Except for Jonathan. Verse one, it's this amazing passage where Jonathan says to his armor bearer, as he sees the enemies of God, come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. He didn't even tell his father. In verses four through 10, we see his plan. We see this, this, this basically a suicide mission. Any of you guys ever watched Bear Grylls? Nobody? You should watch Bear Grylls. Okay, a couple of you guys. So Bear Grylls is the first time I ever heard anyone use the word Rocky Crag. So, so you watch Bear Grylls, you see him on this, this unstable terrain. He's eating like food out of animals, feces, and he's living off the land in extreme ways. He, he's, in, he's, in, he's in environments that are rugged, rocky, and dangerous. And many of you have never experienced a, a, a rough, rocky crag. And so when you, when you hear this passage, it doesn't really sit with you, but I encourage you like Google rocky crags. Think of, a, think of a sharp valley that is filled with stones that, that says they had to crawl on their hands and knees to get up. This wasn't walking through Central Park. This was, hey, we're going to go down this rocky crag and we're going to go up and the two of us are going to fight these 20 guys. And by the way, they didn't have swords or spears. They had their farming weapons that were shaped into weapons. And that was the armor that they had. And, and by the way, we're not going to tell dad even though they've got 600 people, we're going to go, and the two of us, we're going to fight these, these, these Philistines. And at some point you should study, you should Google and watch YouTubes about the Philistines. They were nasty people. They were the most dangerous, most vile people of their time. They would kill people. They would take their skin off and use their skin for, you know, purses and clothes. Like they... They made Jeffrey Dahmer look timid. They were nasty. And, and Jonathan is saying, hey, hey, me and you, we're going to go fight these guys because he had a plan. He had a vision. 
Now, as a church planner, you often hear people quote Proverbs 29, 18, which says in the King James, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The vision in this verse refers to a divine communication as from a dream, revelation, or prophecy. Most church planners aren't getting divine dreams or prophecy from God. That's what it was used in Proverbs 29, 18, and it's also found in 1 Samuel 3, verse 1. It's the context and the rarity of God speaking to his people through the prophets. So this plan that Jonathan had wasn't in some sort of, you know, I feel like the Lord's leading me a certain way. Let me, let, me, let me test the direction of the wind. Let's throw a leaf in the air and if it goes that, no. He understood who God was and what he revealed. If you go back to 1 Samuel 2, verses 9 and 10, it says this about God. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So it's almost like Jonathan, he believed what God said through the prophets. It's almost like he took God for his word. So when he saw the armies of the Philistines, he didn't cower in fear. He said, we're going to go fight them and maybe the Lord will save by many or by few. Have any of you guys ever fought on a mountain? Okay, I don't want to assume nobody has. Uh, it's strategically better to have the high ground. Okay? So, Jonathan's plan at face value seems insane. What he says is, hey, me and you are going to go up and we're going to go be seen by the 20 or so guys that hate our guts and want to kill us. And if they come down off the mountain, um, then we'll take the earth. They say, hey, we don't we don't want to fight you guys. We'll take that as a sign we go back. But if they say, hey, come on, come on up here. If they want to fight us, then we'll see that as a sign that God wants us to go. Like, that's crazy. That's like going to Planned Parenthood and saying, hey, man, um, if people revile us and spit on us, then we know we're supposed to be there. But if, you know, like they're, they're, they're laying out a fleece. He's laying out a fleece before his armor bearer saying, if the worst thing happens, we'll know that the Lord is calling us to this. And I think it's because his plan and vision wasn't based upon his own strategy or a church planning manual, but it was based upon the word of God. There's countless scriptures about God taking care of his people, cutting off the, the wicked, Casting them in the darkness, shattering them to pieces. No swords, no spears. They had the low ground. But this is what he lays out to his armor bearer. God hasn't called us or Jonathan or his armor bearer, anyone who's been bought with the precious blood of Jesus, to comfort. We are called to trust in God and his promises. We live in a culture which Brother John said yesterday, we've created an art form taking comfort. Like they make couches and chairs that turn into beds so people can lay in your couch and bed for 14 hours and binge watch four seasons of office in a row. And we laugh, but we do it. We bought into it. We see the armies of the living God all around us and we say, you know what? We're, we're gonna stay in the camp. We don't understand God's word or if we understand it, we're not obeying it. <coughs> we need to live and love believing God at his word. And I believe the reason that most people are afraid to engage in the battle outside of 
the home is because most people's personal lives are not being led well. I'll give you guys six quick healthy rhythms and I can almost guarantee that no one does these six perfect, but I think if you do these six healthy rhythms that it can assure that you'll be leading yourself well, which will help preserve you as you go into this battle. The first rhythm, as I said yesterday, is praying and read, praying and reading the word daily. I, I would say start in the morning, make it a habit, be dogmatic about it, schedule it, put it on the calendar. Next thing is to date your spouse well. Love your spouse. Don't be like me and, and, and start losing your family. If you don't have your family support, if you're married, you don't have your wife or your husband's support, you'll be super ineffective on the mission field. The third is to get adequate sleep. I, I would encourage eight hours a night, but I'll, I'll, I'm okay with six. I think six to eight hours is it's the way God's created our bodies. It's actually an act of worship to say, you know what, I'm going to sleep for eight hours. And Lord, you got it. And God, in, miraculously, as you sleep, you'll, your heart will still beat, your blood will still flow, your lungs will still breathe. Isn't that amazing? You're not even thinking about it. The next is exercise regularly. Um, my armor bearer, Rick, was supposed to meet me here on Thursday at noon so we could go to a, on a pizza tour. And God had other plans. Rick said, I'll be there about five. And I just started walking. And I did seven and a half miles around Central Park. And it was excellent. And I encourage you guys, if you don't like exercise, just walk. Everybody can walk. Most of us. Um, exercise regularly and, and eat, eat better. This will help make you more effective to lead yourself. Um, there's a thing in the Bible called the Sabbath. Um, Sabbath is meant for men. Sabbath is meant so that we can honor and worship the Lord, take a break from, from these things, take a break from all, all the, the difficult things which weigh us down and just be with our creator, enjoying him, enjoying others. And the last is, is that, did I do five? Yes. The last is um, to be a member of a local church and not just a member that shows up sits in the back pew and comes back the next week, but a member who is accountable, a member who's known and who knows others, someone who's transparent, someone who doesn't hide their sin. So I encourage everyone in here to do those six things. If you do those six things, I believe that God will help you uh, be more effective. So you have to plan that. You, some of you guys are going to have to put time on your calendar for those things. I don't naturally want to go work out. I don't naturally, it takes two hours to walk like seven miles. And because of this hiking trip, I'm like, I better, I don't want to be the guy who's at the back of the pack or the guy has to get airlifted out. So I better do everything in my power <laughs> to be the guy who's walking. I can control that. So we need to lead ourselves well. Plan on that. Third point is under opposition, a faithful leader trusts the Lord. Okay. In verse six, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And I know it's been said several times in this conference that the size of this, this room, um, you know, there's, if you go to, you know, T4G, you're going to have 20,000 dudes, you know, and all that. And Rick gave me the thumbs down. Um, but I'm telling you, when you look at scripture, you, very rarely do you see a pattern of massive crowds. Like if anything, you see massive crowds that God will oftentimes dwindle down. He'll trim the fat off. God is, is I mean, think about Jesus and the 12 and really Jesus and his three. Like God has a, a powerful way of using those who trust in him to do miraculous things. And this passage is no different. And ultimately, Jonathan's trust in the Lord came because he understood God's faithfulness. Joshua 21, 45 says, not one of all, not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. 
Deuteronomy 32, verse four. He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Psalm 33, verse four. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all that he does. Church, God's track record is perfect. He never stops and will never stop being faithful. For him to be unfaithful is for him to deny himself. It was never about the number of people. It's always been about the one whom the people trust. And so maybe you need a reminder of God's faithfulness. I want to read to you the words of one of my favorite songs. It says, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Help me out, Andy. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And it goes on to talk about the seasons, and I don't want to make y'all sit through my singing. But this is why we sing songs about God's faithfulness, is because we forget. The reason we're d disobedient to God's call on our life is because we forget who he is and what he's called us to do. We, ultimately, it's a sign of distrust. Adam and Eve, the first, the first sin, ultimately Adam, like usurping his authority to his, his wife, who he should have protected and stood up for God's word. But ultimately, when she took that fruit and he sat back, he was almost like saying, I don't know if God's faithful. I don't know if his word's true. I don't know if he really is who he says he is or he's going to do what he said he's going to do. And that's the same sin that we have today. We forget the Lord's faithfulness. But I want to remind us, if you're going to be a faithful leader who leads through opposition, you need to trust your faithful God. Fourth point is this. Under opposition, a faithful leader will inspire others. I love this passage in verse 7 after he tells his armor bearer this crazy plan. Um, the armor bearer says this. Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. And the reason I showed you that picture of my family and I told you the context of my church was I say some crazy stuff sometimes and I do some wild stuff for the kingdom. And by God's grace, we, we, we grew from two families to 40 families, not because I was this amazing guy or I had some cool strategies, but people would tell me, hey, we believed in you and we believed that you believed in what God was going to do. And they attached themselves. And then they became inspired and they helped inspire others. And the way I've led my sons. Now they're saying, we're, we're, we're not afraid to go into dark places. We're not afraid to go fight hard battles and be around pagans. I have brought them with me to the abortion centers. I've led them that way because I believe in God and what he said he's going to do. And so as, I, as I'm led that way, I'm helping lead others. And that's what God will do through you. There's a pattern in scripture, the, Paul, the apostle Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Basically, I'm going to inspire you as I've been inspired by God. Imitate me as, as I follow him. But make no mistake, Jonathan didn't go alone. Jonathan didn't go alone. We see the pattern of Jesus sending them out two by two. And in this passage, we see that Jonathan had his armor bearer. And so accountability, transparency, the one another's of scripture cannot be done in isolation. You need at least two people. The second great commandment, the first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself, your, your brother or sister as yourself. You can't practice Christianity in isolation. It's like a tree falling in the woods. No one around to hear it. Did it make a sound? Maybe. But 
We know it when we're there to see it and experience it. God's plan for the church is that you would be sanctified in community. Now, could you be sanctified on a deserted island? Maybe if you had a volleyball named Wilson and a Bible. But the, God's plan for sanctification is this. It's God's people come together. God's plan for mission is him sending them out. The armor bearer was inspired. We saw his fellow Israelites being inspired. We even saw Saul being inspired to join in. And then there'd be a future shepherd king that's more famous in scripture who uses similar language. Who are they to defy? The living God. Let us go and defeat them. King David. I believe King David was inspired by Jonathan and we know later that Jonathan would be a great help to him. So my question is, who or what are you inspiring others to follow? I was talking with my good brother. I want to mispronounce his name. It's not Saddam. What's your name, brother? Sarah? Sarah. I was talking to Sarah about this last night. If, if, you, if, if, if your life was on trial, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a Christian? If I asked others about you, hey, what's the most important thing about Monica? Oh man, she loves working at blah, 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 and she does the, or is it Jesus Christ, him crucified? Like she's always talking about Jesus. She's always serving this Jesus. She's, oh, is there enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a Christian? And I, and I say the church full of people who I know are all in, but I'm telling you, you're gonna have the tendency, like all of us, to take your foot off the gas, to binge watch Netflix for three straight days on your couch that converts to a bed. We need to always be evaluating our lives, seeing what we're being influenced by and what we're influencing others to. Faithful leader will inspire others. Missed opposition, fifth point, last point. A faithful leader will witness the Lord's faithfulness in miraculous ways. We see here in this passage this insanely dumb plan, basically, by man's standards. Two guys versus 20 or more. Lack of weapons. Rocky crag, crawling on hands and knees. And yet, what do we see? The 20 are defeated. Confusion comes in the camp. The ground is trembling. And God gets the victory. That's what I love about this church. Honestly, it's, it's actually kind of foolish, Andy, to think that you and Emma and this group of ragtag young folks could actually make a difference here in New York City. It's not fancy. It's not, I mean, it's nice, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not dissing the pews and stuff. Actually, I was hurt, my back was hurting yesterday. It's a long time to be sitting in these chairs. But this is not about the outward. This is about what's inside of you guys and how you guys can take the gospel of Jesus Christ into the darkest places and see people come to faith, to see the kingdom of God advance. What I love about being a Christian in New York City is you guys have to be deeply reliant on God. You live a life of dependence. Rocky crags, tall buildings, opposition. I mean, I started coming here 18 months ago and, and the vax mandates and all the silly stuff. It's like, who wants to be in that? Who wants to, who wants to, I mean, most people are leaving New York City. So I encourage you guys, stay, stay rooted. You're going to get married as, as much as it depends on you. Stay, have children, be a light. 
it would make a lot of sense to move away. She's like, don't tell him this. We already had plans. We're, we're going, but like, no, like stay here. Keep being faithful and watch the Lord do work. But ultimately, the most amazing display of God's love and miracles was the, the love of Christ and his incarnation. I want to read from Spurgeon. He says this about the incarnation. For this love of Christ is indeed measureless and fathomless. None, none can attain to it. Before we can have any right idea of the love of Jesus, we must understand his previous glory in its height of majesty and his incarnation upon the earth in all its depths of shame. But who can tell us the majesty of Christ? When he was enthroned in the highest heavens, he was very God of very God. By him were the heavens made and all the hosts thereof. His own almighty arm upheld the spheres. The praises of cherubim and seraphim perpetually surrounded him. The full chorus of the hallelujahs of the universe unceasingly flowed to the foot of his throne. He reigned supreme above all his creatures, God over all, blessed forever. Who can tell his height of glory then? And who, on the other hand, can tell how low he descended? To be a man was something. To be a man of sorrows was far more. To bleed and die and suffer. These were much more for him who was the son of God. But to suffer such unparalleled agony, to endure a death of shame and desertion by his father, this is the depth of condescending love, which the most inspired mind must utterly fail to fathom. Herein is love, and truly it is love that passeth knowledge. Oh, let this love fill our hearts with adoring gratitude and lead us to practical manifestations of its power. Church, we leave the comforts of the camp because Jesus Christ left heaven to come to earth. Jesus Christ, fully God, became fully man to live the life that you could not and die the death that you deserved. He was buried and he rose three days later from the grave, proving that he was God, that he was victorious over your past, present, and future. For all those who trust in him, you're declared righteous and you're called to imitate him. You're called to walk out on earth what he did on earth, that your life would be a living sacrifice, that daily you'd be transformed and renewed and conformed into his image, which will include suffering, which will include opposition. That's what we're called to as Christians. And the reality is that God is faithful to himself. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close us with Psalm 46, studying it this week. It just reminded me of what it must be like to live in New York City with opposition all around. There's rarely sunlight or trees. Instead, you're met with buildings, opposition, pride flags everywhere people saying that you guys are intolerant bigots, Christian nationalists, from the church even. But yet the psalmist says in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress.
fortress. Church, we can be both faithful and fruitful because we are in Christ who is faithful. We must not fear men. Instead, we must only fear him. He who has all the power and authority has commissioned us to go, to make disciples. The king of the universe has commissioned us, his people, to help build his kingdom. What a great privilege. It's exciting. We've been called to, by God to order our lives for his glory, to lead and influence others, to follow him, to trust him, to put ourselves in positions of great danger where we desperately need his grace, where we desperately need his power. We need to put ourselves and order our lives in such a way where we need God to show up miraculously in ways that only he can so that only he will get the glory. And in the end, we'll be victorious because he is victorious. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I pray that in some small way or some major way, God, that you would take what was said today and that you would inspire all of us in a deeper way to order our lives in such a way that we live dependent on you. God, forgive us for the many times we, we seek our comforts, we seek our own pleasures, and we stiff arm you and your plan for our life to be disciples who make disciples God, I'll be at the front of the line to admit that I don't always like where you called me to go, God, but I thank you, God, that you're with me, you're with us, that we get to be a part of helping build your kingdom. I pray, God, your blessing on the people in this room, that they would influence, they would be men and women of God who proclaim the gospel of God by the power of God, and the grace of God to win many people in the city to you, Lord. They would not compromise. They would not uh, fall victim to pragmatism, to strategy, but God, that the, the holy word of God would be their inspiration. So God, I pray that you would do miraculous things in and through these folks and build your kingdom here in New York City, in Jesus' name.